Hello my friends, it's Ranger Russ from the Megs Point Nature Center. You can see today we are going to be doing our dune program that I didn't get to do yesterday. So Hammond Acid is open. It is beautiful day here. Very cool, not very hot. Might warm up a little bit later, but for now it's a gorgeous day to be at Hammond Acid. So we're going to start out taking a look at some of the plants that we have on our dune. And if you can see this beautiful purple flower here, this is beach pea, one of the common flowers. Now, if you think of the peas that you get in a store, this is not going to be that kind of pea. It looks similar. You'd be able to recognize it, but not a nice, big, juicy pea that you're really going to want to eat. But it's a vine. It grows all through the dunes here. Okay. Growing next to it, this grassy plant is dune grass. And we have many species of dune grass here at Hammonasset. Dune grass is the main plant that holds a dune in place. So if you think about a dune as just a pile of sand, there's nothing that would hold it in one place. It would move as the wind blows or if the waves reached it, it would be able to wash away. These dune plants hold the dune in place. And if we step back and you look at the sand, you can see as soon as it starts to get the grasses, it goes up a little bit higher and it will begin to create that mound of sand that we think of when we think about a dune. If we look over here, there is a bit of a trail. Now we encourage people not to walk over the dunes, not to walk on the dunes. Most of the dune grasses are endangered and protected. But we're gonna come up here just so that you can see the difference. So there are different parts of a dune. There's the fore dune or the front dune, and then you've got the middle of the dune, and then you've got the back dune. So here you can see in the middle of our dune, we transition from the dune grass and the beach pea to an invasive species. This is Rugosa rose or beach rose. And you can see we've got some nice pink flowers. Over on this side, we've got white flowers. And then sometimes we have a much lighter pink. So these roses were brought here by the Europeans. They were first introduced in England in the 1700s. I think it was like 1776 or 1717 or something like that where they were first uh, seen in England and they were brought from Asia. And actually in China where they're native, they are considered an endangered species. Uh, they have different categories. I think they call it a rare species, but it is in decline in China where it's native. Here, it's an invasive species you can see is growing all over the place out here. One of the things later in the season, these flowers will turn into rose hips. It'll look like a, like a small tomato. And they're very high in vitamin C. So the sailors, as they were sailing around the world years ago on their wooden ships, they would stop and harvest the rose hips for vitamin C. And that vitamin C helped prevent them from getting scurvy. Scurvy happens when you have a lack of vitamin C. And uh, that's why pirates say, you know, you scurvy dog, it means you're sick and you're not eating all of your, or getting enough vitamin C in your diet. And the, the, one of the reasons that British sailors were called limeys is because they carried limes to get vitamin C. And they would get the vitamin C. Now, if you look under here, I think that might be evening primrose or um, I'm blanking. Seaside goldenrod is growing down there. And if we go over here, so this is another invasive. This is tree of heaven. These should not be growing in our dunes. This is a, a common plant. It used to be planted uh, as an ornamental. 
I think most people realize now how invasive it is. It's a fast growing tree that will take over an area and we do try and control it here. Oh, here we go. There's another plant. So we've got some poison ivy. Poison ivy here can grow out in the open like this. It will grow as a standing shrub. By the end of the season, this could get eight feet tall. See, we actually have a lot of Ragosa rose or beech rose out here. Now over here, there's a couple of trees um, that are planted. So these are our uh, pitch pines. And these were planted uh, when the, this dune was actually man-made, our dune here. When they created the dune, they planted these to help stabilize the dune. It's a fast-growing tree. Um, much faster than the native tree, which grows in the dune, and that's this one here. This is the uh, red cedar juniper, which we did an entire program on. If you go to our uh, website, megspointnaturecenter.org, you can see um, the whole program on the cedar tree. You can also see it on YouTube, the Megs Point Nature Center YouTube channel. So if we look down here, you're going to see more poison ivy. So that's the flower of the poison ivy right there. And then we've got the new growth, which is reddish. There's a question. Pamela is asking, do you try and remove the poison ivy or let it grow to an eight foot shrub? We let it grow. Poison ivy is a native plant. It's beneficial to the wildlife that we have here at Hammonasset. Um, and it's really not, if you're staying where you should be at the park, we will remove it if it's growing out on a trail. But other than that, when it's growing out here in the dunes, we're going to let it go. People shouldn't be back here, so you shouldn't really uh, run in contact with it. Interesting that I've seen rose hips many times on Cape Cod National Seashore. Never remember them referring to them as rose hips for sailors. Yeah, so the any rose can produce the rose hips. The beach rose produces a really nice larger fruit. Um, you can make rose hip tea out of it. They're actually pretty tasty if you just eat them by themselves. So now we're in the interdune, in the middle of the dune. There's a little dip here. And as you move through a dune, you're gonna notice, if you were here, you would notice a difference in temperature. The amount of wind you get is much less back here. So you get a really defined line. Uh, when, you, when there's a, a very narrow dune, there's a defined line between the front dune and the back dune. Because once you get over that lip, there's no breeze. The dune cuts the breeze and it makes it much warmer. So this is poison ivy again. Notice it's yellowy back here. This is exposed to the sun more. So it's already turning yellow. The end of the season, it turns really yellow. This is growing kind of like a, uh, a shrub. And then we've got ground cover back there. That's also poison ivy. So poison ivy loves the dunes. And here we have a nice cedar tree growing by itself. A couple of other cedar trees over here. I don't know if you guys can hear it, but there's a willet making some noise on the other side of these trees. We'll see if it's there when I go to the other side. So over here we've got, now this is a, a native, so I really like these. This is a uh, plant that was used by the settlers when they first arrived. Uh, it's used in uh, potpourri, it's a, a nice smell. It gets a waxy berry, which they used to put in candles. And Yankee Candle actually has a candle. This is bayberry. 
and it has a bayberry scented candle. If you've ever been to Yankee Candle, the leaves just rubbing against them, you get the nice aroma from the bayberry. And then there's a vine, not a common vine, uh, Virginia creeper. Uh, typically grows more away from the dunes, uh, but this is sheltered enough on the backside of the dune so it's able to grow. And do we have any other questions? I'm going to... What ways does poison ivy benefit the wildlife in the park? The seeds are eaten by birds and other animals eat the seeds, but mainly it's birds. Uh, the tree swallows just before their migration, they bulk up on bayberry and poison ivy. And that's pretty much all that they eat as they're getting ready to head out. They can eat insects, but before their migration, they uh, bulk up on all those seeds. And the willet is flying away, unfortunately. We'll see if it circles back to us. So now we're on the back side of the dune. And we're actually going into a little marshy area. So before these dunes were placed here at Hammonasset, you can see the old nature center and the new nature center next to it. Before these dunes were put in, the, there was just the beach and then a salt marsh and then uh, when it became a park, they put a road down along the beach. The dunes were built, these trees, and you can see one of them is dying there. Um, the trees were planted, and we really changed the environment a little, a little bit by doing that. We created a buffer. Dunes are supposed to be a buffer. They're a natural buffer. In this case, we created it so uh, not as natural, but it is a natural buffer between a salt marsh or any inland habitat and the beach habitat. So you can look here, the salt marsh, before this was a park, the beach would have gone right out into the salt marsh. Sally is at Hammonasset right now. Very cool. It's a big beach, so I don't know where you are. Maybe at the far end of the beach. All right, so as we transition from the dunes into the salt marsh, we get a change of the plants. Now, you can see over there, there's some, that tall grass right there, that's Phragmites. It's actually a reed, not a grass. And then we've got this shorter grass is not dune grass, it's going into cord grass. We've got more poison ivy, we've got mar marsh alder, we've got a, ce a dead cedar tree. So as the tide comes up and starts to take over more, the cedars aren't going to be able to survive. All right, and then we're going to move further along over here. and get a nice look at the salt marsh. So that is the boardwalk going over to Meg's Point bathhouse. And you can see a defined line between the marsh grasses. And again, we did a program on salt marshes. And then you've got the marsh alder you get high tide bush in there as well, but I can never tell those two apart easily. And then you move up into the, you can see the white flowers. Those are beach rose along with the pink beach rose. All right, let's go over here. So later in the season, the seaside goldenrod will be blooming. It'll be fantastic all up and down the, the road here. The birds will stop and, uh, or the butterflies use it on their migration. Here's a cool little one. This is Curly Dock. 
This is more of a roadside plant than a dune plant, um, but it can live again on the backside of the dune where it's protected and sheltered. This is in the buckwheat family. So later in the season, this will turn a deep rusty red color and you can harvest it and make pancakes out of it. So I was saying that the dune acts as a buffer. It not only buffers uh, from the wind, but in the winter, when we get the big storms, the wind carries salt water with it. And, uh, and that salt water will cause a lot of plants won't be able to survive with that salt water. So that's why the dune makes a really good buffer. Those, the dune grass is able to survive being sprayed with salt all year. My car, if you look at my car at the end of each day on a windy day, covered in salt. Did we lose audio? Okay, if anybody has any questions, you can ask them. I'm actually seeing there's some honeysuckle over there too, which is another invasive that not necessarily supposed to be on the, uh, on the dune. And we've got some sumac right here, not poison sumac, so it's okay to touch it. All right, so we've got another program coming up this afternoon at two o'clock. And then tomorrow again at 11 and 2. So you can tune in Tuesdays to Fridays at 11 and 2 to Facebook Live. And we also will be putting up some YouTube videos in the hopefully near future. I've been filming things, so we'll put those together. And you can watch additional videos on our YouTube channel. So until this afternoon, I'm going to sign off. I hope everyone enjoyed looking at our dunes, and we will see you this afternoon at 2 o'clock.